Good morning, everybody, those that are here in the auditorium live, as well as to those who are on Zoom tuning in for us. And we appreciate you all taking the time to get up before worship to come to Bible study. You know, we're in the football season, which is pains me to say that, but there's something called pregame. You know, it's good to come to Bible study before the worship starts because it helps get you in the right frame of mind. Today, without further ado, we're going to jump back into uh, the book of 1 Peter. We're going to start right here at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. The title of this message is The Power of the Christian Marriage. The Power of the Christian Marriage. And some of you may say, well, I'm not married. This has nothing to do with me. Oh, well, yes, it does. Because it's universal. Many times we look for marriage scriptures and all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is good for marriage. All scripture is good for any kind of living. You just have to pull the principles out to show you how to live. But in essence, when you look at how God set the marriage up, marriage is supposed to be the metaphor or the perfect example of what the church is all about. Now, that's pretty powerful when God equates with marriage with church. That means we should get all we can in us. Because that day may come when you may meet that Susie or you may meet that Jody and you may decide the holy matrimony. And I stress the holy part of matrimony, the part we're supposed to know. So let's take a look at first Peter chapter three and verse one. Now it starts off with, I love how it starts off with likewise. Our dear brother Gail always said, when you see therefore know what it's there for, well, likewise automatically has it has a it's an indicator to go back and see what he said before, because this is supposed to be in similar fashion. Let's read the verse and we'll go back and see what the likewise is all about. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Uh oh, I've seen that misquoted and misunderstood by so many things. Hang on, let me get through the whole lesson and you'll see that we're both held accountable, husbands and wives, to do what God has called us to do. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. You see, many times if the, a husband with the wrong mindset reads this, he sees himself, I'm a child. And many times a, a, a wife who read, misreads this will say, wait a minute, I gotta be in subjection to him? It's not about any of that. We're gonna talk about what it's really talking about. But it's all about what's our responsibility to each other in the sight of God. I tell people, if you go on your job, I'll use an example when I was in the Marine Corps. Some, some of the officers that were over us hadn't spent one day in battle. So they would come in talking all hard and hard. But when they came by, you had to give your salute. You had to respect the status, even if you didn't want to or not, because that's how it was set up. If not, then you were held accountable. Well, God has given us clear direction on how we're supposed to be a Christian marriage and a Christian family. Now, as I said before, the first verse, likewise, what is that talking about? Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at the last two verses. Good morning, everybody. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to pick up at verse 24. Here, Peter, through the Holy Spirit, says, who his own self bear our sin. Now, that can be only, only one person, Jesus the Christ. Look where the focus is. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, the tree being the cross. It says that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. This is so clever by Peter. Verse 25, the last verse of 1 Peter 2. For ye were as sheep going astray. It means we were completely lost. We needed a leader, a spiritual leader. It says, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So how does that tie into the, the wife, you may think? Because look at where her focus should be. See, Christ, and you all know I use this verse all the time. When it, it says how Christ endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Book of Hebrews. Think if he would have just not focused on us. And just said, man, they're going to beat me down to the point of killing me. They're going to flog me to where it tears open my flesh. You see, if he would have stayed there, he may not have completed the task. But he didn't. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. I'm talking about his father. You see, the focus, no matter how gruesome, and this is an extreme example, because none of us can, 
can really go through what Jesus went through. But he did it because of his focus on the end game. The end game was to bring us salvation. Hebrew says, for the joy that was said before him. Husband and wives, can we put aside if we have any differences or whatever? And look at, that's why he says, likewise, look what Jesus put aside. He put aside this flesh to the point of death. I don't think anybody, no one in this world can ever compare to that. So that's the motivation we should have. We should have the focus of Christ first in our lives, especially if we're in a marriage because we represent the church. He says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Notice there's a modifier, their own. So that cuts out. We, we don't have to talk about cheating or side chick, any of that. We all know better than that anyway. But it says, subject to your own husband. Like I said, there have been ladies that have said, oh, ain't no way I'm and I tell them quickly that you should not get married. As simple as that. Because if you do, you just stir in a pot. This is what the Bible says. But the Bible doesn't stop there. The man has responsibility too. So just think like, this is all on me. No, it's not. It continues. It says, and if any obey not the word. That's talking about other people who have not obeyed the gospel. It says, also maybe without the word be won by the conversation of the wise. You see, it's supposed to be an encouragement. Now, the man has a responsibility, as we said. No time to go into all of it. But it's easier for a lady to respect a man and stay with a man if the man is doing his Bible, a Bible job. That makes it much easier. I love how my, my brother the other day said, my wife and kids are a recipient of my faithfulness to God. Couldn't be put any better. That should almost be a scripture. <laughs> it can't be, put any, can't be put any better than that. That's exactly what the relationship is supposed to render. It should be joy. Bible lets us know, 1 Peter chapter uh, 3 in the second verse. Remember, this is all about our exampleship in front of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 2, it says, While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Once again, it says, while they, they are those who are outside the church, not saved. Behold your, that's us Christians, your chaste conversation. Look at the specific verbiage. James talks about that untamed tongue, and it ties right to this. What is your conversation like as a Christian? When you're around church members or not around church members? Because your conversation alone could draw people and make them have a make them want to say, ah, wow, you're a little bit different. I used to love. A while back when I worked for a place called His House Children's Home, my, both my boys went to school on their site. And I got comments. One teacher came to me and he claimed to have been a minister and he was teaching the kids how to pray. And he never ended the prayers in, in Jesus' name. Guess who confronted him right in the classroom? No one other than the little man you guys know is Ricky Nelson. The teacher knew me well and came to me and said, well, your boy knows the Bible. That's <laughs> I said. Did you pray in Jesus' name? I said, nah, he, can't. he took you to scripture too. I said, absolutely. And it was a real, real blessing because his chaste conversation made a, a person look and say, wow, he's, he's coming right from the word. That's, a, that's our duty. Not the duty of a, a minister or a deacon or an elder that gives me. It's the duty of a Christian. The greatest thing that can be confessed on any tongue. And it says coupled with fear. That's not fear like you're just totally terrified. It's a reverence. Me and Gail have stood taller than our mother for many, many years. But you can best believe when she said, get that broom and mop that, get that broom and sweep that floor. We didn't think twice about talking back because the reverence was so great. And the reason why the reverence was so great was because she showed the love and caringness and adoration way before she had to yield the belt. And when she yielded the belt, you can best believe we didn't try to run or anything. I would often, to this day, I tell kids that I talked to that I ran away from home. I was like, why did you run away from home? And many of them just, they just got hot, ran out of the house and didn't know where to go. I said, it never, ever crossed my mind to run from home. Now, part of it was selfish. So I'm like, get out there, what am I going to eat? When you go up to Grandma Cubby's house, so you think of that food right away. And I was like, wow, how could you run from home? But such is the case. May we be the examples that we're supposed to be for the sake of Christ.
The phrase I like to say, he died for us. We're supposed to live for him. Once again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, as we hasten on. It says, now the who's here is talking about the wife. It says, who's adorning? And normally when we say, when we say adorning, we think of, you know, pearls and the outward appearance. Adorning in the general Greek meant how you overall presented yourself. It had a little bit to do with the outside, but it had more to do with the inside than anything. I'll tell people, have you ever seen uh, a real pretty lady or a man that's considered handsome and you already form an image? It's like, oh, they're pretty, pretty sharp. And then they open their mouth. And then what you thought you would hear is not what you expected. It's like, oh, man, no. The mouth can shape you so quickly and your overall adorning can be shaped so, so much. Bible says here, who's adorning, the wife's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, as we just said, a plaiting of the hair. Nothing wrong with plaiting the hair or wearing a gold or putting on apparel. Nothing wrong with that. But is that is that what you're going to be known for? And that's so common in this day and age. One of the many things that drew me to my wife, Stephanie, was that she could have on a $10,000 dress, not saying she ever had it's a, the fanciest shoes. But when you talk to her and you see her smile, it didn't reflect. You didn't think, oh, she's not some high food in high society lady. She's really, really down to earth. And I tell her that as much as I can because it didn't adorn her at all. Bible continues, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, praise God. It says, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great cross. Once again, I've met ladies that say, well, that, that's just not my demeanor. I said, well, and whenever people say that, I take them, I don't compare them to anybody else but Christ. I said, you think Christ's demeanor was the, like he wanted to go to the cross? He wanted to go through all that punishment for us who were yet in sin? He did it because he loved us. You can't modify your personality. I tell people all the time, the fact that I'm even up here speaking totally goes against my, my, my demeanor when I was growing up. It's quiet as a mouse. But when I studied the Bible, I knew I have something to say and I have to say it. So we can adjust. We study the fruit of the spirit. There are some more outgo outward going people. There are more quiet people. But either way, you have to possess that fruit of the spirit. It requires you to crucify the flesh sometimes. Well, what does that mean? We go back to Romans 12 and 1 if you have time. Read Romans 12. It tells you that's a part of our daily sacrifice. Then you don't change your personality, but you may have to modify some things. I knew people in the Marine Corps that cursed fluently. It was like a second language. But when they came to Christ, they definitely took two or three seconds before they spoke. It was a funny thing to see too, but you could just see the desire. I don't have to speak like this. When you put Christ first, you'd be amazed what you can Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5, for after this manner, notice he says manner, that ties directly to it's a behavior. When you look at righteous living, when the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the righteousness simply means right doing. Doing means behavior. So there is a manner that's expected amongst Christians. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women, look at the example. I love how Peter lets us know there's some things we can learn being New Testament Christians. There's some things we can learn about how to live from the Old Testament. That's not talking about the Old Testament law or anything. It's examples for us. As Gail said in last week's lesson, Romans 15 and 4. For whatsoever was written aforetime, were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We can learn a lot how living. And he gives us a clear example. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God. Notice the qualifier. He's talking about those who trusted in God, not all of them, but those who trusted in God. What was the result? Adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. One of the many things that I teach my kids are exactly what their grandma Cubby taught me. Because it was biblical and it worked with me and my brother, so I wasn't sure it was my kids. There's a phrase called tried and true. 
The scriptures are timeless. They're tried and true. The thing is, will we give them an opportunity to work in our lives? First Peter chapter three and verse six. Now it gives us a specific example. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, look at that, calling him Lord. Now that's not before anybody gets upset. That's not Lord capital L, like the Lord of Lords, Jesus the Christ. It's just a reference to leader, the Lord, the head of the household, the master. Not master is in slavery, just master in charge. Sometimes we look at these words like master, oh man, they got it all. Ah. With great responsibility, with, with, with great talent comes great responsibility. It's not just the title, it's what you're supposed to do. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. That's where this, this sums up all the likewise. Look at all the examples of the godly women in the Old Testament. Look at the powerful example. Now, remember, I always said, look out for likewise, right? Now we get to the man. Look at verse number seven, 1 Peter chapter three. Likewise. Now, what is this likewise referring to? What we just read up until this point. How the, how the ladies, why is it supposed to be faithful to their own husbands? Now, here's the reciprocal effect. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. Who is them? The wife, yes, sir. With them according to what? Let's look at the person. According to knowledge. What does that mean? So that means you got to take time to understand. I've heard of <laughs> a so called a, a guy had four PhDs. He says, of everything I've studied, there's still one thing I can't figure out. I thought he was going to say something spiritual. He says, the woman. He says, we are days and days apart. But the thing is, are you taking time to understand? Because see, if you took time to say, I do, then you have to take time to understand. Because if you don't, the Bible gives us a, a real powerful metaphor. If you have your Bibles, turn Proverbs 21 and the verse is 9. And then we'll come back to 1 Peter 3 and 7. If you don't understand your wife, it can result to this. And this is a man who qualifies to say this. This is Solomon, the man who had a serious woman problem. But this is what our brother Solomon said, Proverbs 21 and verse 9. It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop. Now, so important, it's important to get the visual of this. Usually when you're on the, on the housetop and you're in the corner, usually when you see that, you're about to jump for some, for some reason that you can't understand. So he said it's better to be in that corner on a housetop. A little bitty space, it's a corner of a roof, Compared to what? It says, then with a brawling woman in a wide house. You got all this space to go, but there's a brawling woman in there. He said, it's better to be on the corner of a rooftop by yourself than the back. Because they're not seeking understanding. That's powerful. So we're supposed to dwell with them according to knowledge. You got to take time to get to know them. Let's go back to 1 Peter 3 and 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. It says, giving honor unto the wife. And the person says, well, I give honor, I give honor. Well, what does that mean? Well, I buy things. That's a small piece of the honor. Now, you got to let the scripture interpret honor for you. That verse, actually, that phrase continues. It says, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. I don't think I've found a more scripture misinterpreted than that. Many times we interpret it from our feelings from, well, you know, you see in sports, you know, man is more muscular. It has nothing to do with physical stature. Has nothing to do with mental strength either. Matter of fact, it literally has nothing to do with flesh in, in a sense. Whenever you see vessel in almost every case in the, New, in the New Testament, it refers back to something in the Old Testament. You know where the vessel was primarily used at in the Old Testament? When it came to God making vessels, man used pottery. I'm very familiar with pottery. Men use pottery. Matter of fact, let's let the scripture tell us. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. Mankind is called vessel. Why is that? And I say mankind, both men and women are called vessels. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. Look at what's come next. 
We are the clay, that clay is vessel. We are the clay and thou art the potter, representing creator. And we are all the work of thy hand. So now, Brother Nelson, I'm still not seeing the, the, the connection. You see, it says the wife as the weaker vessel. You know what they call the weaker vessel in the Old Testament for pottery? When you made pottery on the potter's wheel, when it was when you finished it, it hadn't been put through a, a, an oven. When it was just made and you finished it at the top, it was considered a weaker vessel. You know why? Because it hadn't hardened yet. It needed to go through something called a kill or an oven. And when the fire passed through it, it hardened up. And there you had a plate, a pot, a cup, or anything. It could be used. But until it went through the fire, it was considered a weaker vessel. Now, but who, were the, who did the Bible call the weaker vessel? Both the man and the woman. So then how can a woman be the weaker vessel? Because God put the man to be the head of the household. He's the one that's ultimately held responsible for that household. That's why he has to take care of his wife. But what about that trying fire? Let's look at the scripture tell us. First Peter chapter one and verse seven. When we did first Peter one a number of months ago, we covered this verse. First Peter chapter one and verse seven. It says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than a gold that perish. Why is he using gold? Because for gold to be pure gold, it's got to be tried through fire, similar to making pottery. And you know what comes out of the gold? All the impurities. And then it becomes 100% pure. Like a vessel that's made out of clay that's hardened up. You send it through the fire, all the impurities burns out, all the air bubbles burn out. And it becomes hard so it can be used. It says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than, than a gold that perish, that it being tried with, what is that? Fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus the Christ. You see, we as husbands have to honor our wives. We have to dwell with them in knowledge. So we help take care of each other as the weaker vessel. So when Christ appears the second time, we can go to heaven together. I don't know about you all, but that sounds like a great opportunity to me. But that's what the weaker vessels talking about. This is what my wife, you know, she, she gets a little sensitive. She cries. It's not talking about that. It's so easy to focus on yourself. We human beings as Christians are the weaker vessel. As we go through this life, we're being tried by fire. We have to look after ourselves and our families. And the man is ultimately held, the husband, excuse me, is ultimately held accountable for that. Going back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And look at that. I love how Peter ends this. It says, And as being heirs together of the grace of life, now, all, out of all the words, why is grace necessary? Because this is a tough world. Raising a family can be tough. What helps the wife get with her husband? What helps the husband get with his wife and with his kids is grace. Because none of us are perfect in and of ourselves. We all have shortcomings. We have to see each other in the family perfectly through the eyes of Christ. That's what makes it easier. And that's only done through grace. You know, I'm upset at her, but you know what? I haven't made some of the best calls in my life either. So let me show a little bit of grace so that we can go another day, another day. And if we know Christ is here. I love how some of the best athletes or coaches in football, when you ask them about the Super Bowl and it's week 16, they'll never say, yeah, we're going to the Bowl. They'll say, oh, we got to focus on the next game. And ask me after that game and in that game, and if we make it to the playoffs, make it through the very end of the championship, then ask me about the Super Bowl. Because they're worried about what's next. Such is the case when you're dealing with problems in your life, especially if it's family problems. Take a day at a time. The Bible tells you, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. That's telling me I better take care of this now before I go in there and take a nine hour, a nine hour nap. Because the minute I do that, I've let the sun go down upon my wrath and I've just given a place to the devil to stir up some more mess. Because I left that undone. The Bible tells us giving uh, according to, to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, unto the weaker vessel, 
and as being heirs together of the grace of life. See that last part? That your prayers be not hindered. You know what's really powerful about that when you read Romans 8? Romans 8 tells us that God has set the Holy Spirit to be an in, in, in intermediary for us to help our prayers get to God according to his will. See how much God has given us? But if we don't do this, we can hinder that. Imagine if somebody told you, you came to somebody and said, I got about $10 million worth of debt. And if I don't pay this tomorrow, I'm going to go to jail. Somebody just said, here's a shovel. Well, you give me a shovel. Just dig three feet in your backyard. You're going to find 20 million. Just knowing that it was been there. All you got to do something simple as that. It's been there all along. That's what we have with the Bible. Especially if we're in a family, husband and father and kids. We have to lean on the values that are found in the Bible. The world will only get you so far. And right when it looks good, it'll drop you so quick. But heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. We hasten on here. First Peter chapter three with verse eight. It says, finally, Peter dropped some knowledge on us, didn't he? Now here's the culmination. Finally, be ye all of one mind. It's a blessing to grow, have a household where you, we can all sit down to eat and the, the younger son says, I'll pray to him. You know, he already knows the expectation or giving thanks when something is done well, being brought up in the Bible. You see, that's all one mind. But look where it continues, having compassion. Now that word, you don't wanna interchange compassion and empathy, they're, they're really not interchangeable. Compassion means you can see somebody's pain. Empathy means you can feel their pain. You, you see it and you understand it. The word here is really empathy. The reason why that one hits me so hard, my family took the opportunity to put on Raider gear and sit there and watch the game with me last night. And man, a couple of times I thought, man, this is over. I thought we had it. I was so happy, Brother Aldrin. Woo! But it's amazing how long 30 seconds can really take. When that game was over, they didn't just see the pain in my face. They all felt it. And I, I was touched because it's like, man, they, 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 they're all feeling what I'm feeling. Because they know how bad I wanted to win that game. But now that pales in comparison to what this is really talking about. It's can we look at people, let alone our own families, and be empathetic to what they're going through. I try to tell my boys as often as I should say, my young men, as often as I can. I said, hey, if you see me doing something that's not Bible, you tell me. And, you know, step to me with respect now. I am your dad. But still, tell me straight up. And I always tell them, growing up, whenever we would go to do church activities, I'd go over to the, to the older folks' home or go here to help out volunteer. Whenever I said, guys, get up, they'd get right up with me and go, no matter what time it was. And a couple of, uh, it's been about two years ago, it hit me hard. I was like, that's, that's really special. You know, you get, so you get caught up in doing it, and you kind of forget the small things. And I told them both, I said, you guys never flinched or said, I don't want to go. You went every single time. So sometimes as parents, we got to say, thank you, kids. Thank you so much. Because that's not the mode that you see in the world today. Sometimes you got to pull them out and then you got to bribe them. But they went on and was always involved. And I appreciate that so much. We got to take time to say thank you, too. We're never too old or too much in charge not to say thank you to our kids. Bible says, finally be ye like-minded, having compassion or empathy, which I said, feeling someone else's suffering. It says, one of another, love. Now, many times when we see love here, we automatically equate to agape love. That's actually not the word here. The word is philly, which is like from Philadelphia, brotherly love. This is specifically talking about like the love of a biological brother or sister. And I got an example that is like a, a, it's so perfect for me. You ever seen the love of a, of a biological brother and sister? Even if you're not even that close to him. Me and my brother always grew up close, but there were times when we had our battles. <laughs> and as a big brother, I had a right to hit him, Sister Valerie. 
But if we go out town and we're at school and somebody wants to beat them up, guess who's the first one to stand in there with them? Because I can hit them, but you can't. That's biological love and that's power. Maybe it's not agape love, it's very similar, but it's an automatic connection because that's my brother. Now we have a blessing of having it both ways. We're brothers in Christ too, so that's powerful. But our love for each other should be the world is not going to take you. The world is not going to hurt you as long as I'm here. Because I'm your brother. Peter's telling us. Finally, be ye of one mind, having compassion, one with another. Love as brethren. And it says, be pitiful. Now that word can often be misquoted. You look at pitiful like, oh, somebody's down. You know what pitiful means in the Greek? It means tenderhearted. Very simple, it's very similar to uh, empathy. You naturally can feel it because you spent time. If you move on a thousand miles an hour, you may miss it. That's why that's so important for elders and deacons to have that because we deal with you all. And we have to have a tender heart so we know what's really going on. What else does Peter say? Imagine all this in a marriage. How could it fail? And the last one there, it says, be courteous. That's simply translated friendly or kind. Shouldn't you be kind? Come in the house. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right. What you doing? No. It's your wife. Verse 9 of 1 Peter 3. It says, not ready. You see, this is a marriage enrichment seminar right here. Ready made just by reading 1 Peter 3. Not rendering evil for evil. That's pretty clear. You see, we can we say that absurd people, people say that so much in dealing with the world. He's talking about marriage here. You get the context. So it's like, well, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't know what she did to me. Well, who are we talking about? Somebody out in the world? No, my wife. So if it's somebody from the outside, you have no problem not rendering evil for evil. But because it's your wife, you're going to give her a piece of your mind. That's what you're saying. It should be easier when it's somebody that close to you to say, you know what, baby, we're both upset. Let's just relax for a minute. It says not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. Peter's calling it, isn't he? But contrarywise, a blessing. I remember I saw, uh, I think I hope I'm quoting their name correctly, Beecham and Faulkner, some just legends in marriage and Richmond. I remember they did a skit that was cracking me up because I love how he went about it. He came in and the wife said, you late again. I'm so mad at you, blah, 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 blah. We, uh, Mr. Faulkner just uh, stood there and he said, you know, I realize uh, I went out and you had to stay here even with our four, four boys. I know that's not easy. He says, I went out on the job today. I actually had a really, really good day and I was excited to come home. That's why I had these flowers right here. He said, but I see you had a hard day. He said, if there's anything I can do, because the day's not over, to make your day better, I want to do it. If I offended you in any way, please apologize. And the lady who knew fully what he was going to say, because it was role playing, she just said, oh, man, like it was real. Because like, what can you say to that? As sincere as he was, he wasn't trying to be angry. He wasn't trying to get, make her day harder, but it was wearing on her heart. And he saw that. It's the tenderheartedness. But notice he came contrary to the way she came to him. She may come at him rowling, growling, but he came to her with a soft tone. Even in, D, in, in, in uh, DJJ psychology, as juvenile justice, they teach us when a kid comes at you with a real, real high tone, you deliberately keep yours nice and even. And in most cases, the kid will at least come down. When he's up and aggressive, he could get violent. You don't want that. Bible said that way before he even was a juvenile. Bible says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are hereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Peter's words are incredible here through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'd like to use an example, one I saw just the other day on TV. You know how they have these little Santas in different department stores? I think it was a Macy's. And a little kid came in, Mama, can I sit on Santa's lap and tell him what I want? She said, go ahead, baby. He went and sit on Santa's lap, and he was ready. He's like, I want the toy train that's in aisle four, a one, two, three, four, uh, the, the bottom one on the shelf, and it's all solid gold. And Simon said, 
wow, to get that one, you must have been really, really good. He says, I am. He said, well, you still got a good seven days left before Christmas. He said, the kid said, no, 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 no. I can get it now because I know I'm going to be good. And just a little zeal and tone coming from his voice. I said, wow, think about that real quick from a Christian standpoint. We know we're going to inherit heaven. That's what we believe, right? Shouldn't our actions follow that, knowing what we're going to inherit? Now, here's the kicker. Now, apply all that in the context of marriage. It's like, baby, we can't be acting like this. We want to inherit heaven together. So let's resolve this and get back into the ways of the Lord. Peter knows how to put it, doesn't he? Woo. Knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. First Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, as we hang on here. We're almost done. For he that will love life and see good days, let him reframe his tongue, there's that tongue again, from evil and his lips that they speak no God. Why does Peter focus so much on the tongue? Because see, any behavior or anything that's said starts up here first. It's in the mind. You don't just wake up cursing. You're upset about something up here first. And if you don't check it here, guess where it goes next? The untamed tongue. I love how James says we can control these big strong horses that we ride. We can uh, steer these big ships, but we can't can bridle this little, the smallest member in our body, the tongue. We can't control that shame on us. And then from the tongue, it goes to behavior. Now he's checked it up here. Now can we check the tongue? Mm -mm -mm. It says, reframe his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no God. Let him askew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Notice ensuing means a continual progress. Process, I'm sorry. Talking about peace. Now we all know the peace that we have from God. We've hit this a couple of times. This piece is not talking about any absence of disorder. It was quite the opposite. It's a world full of disorder because it's a fallen world. But we're supposed to be the peace that's in it. And the peace that we ensue continually all the days of our life is the peace that's only found in God. Philippians 4 lets us know it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. You ain't got to figure it out. Well, why is my wife mad at me today? Just seek understanding. Remember, the context of this is marriage. But you see how this can apply just to making it through life period? That's why I said, even if you're not married, this is some stuff that you can use in your life, just dealing with people. Verses 12 and 13 of 1 Peter 3. Now, just when you, you ever, when you were a kid, you ever do something, Sister Valerie, that you know you're not supposed to be doing? And you think that nobody can see. You turn around, there's mama. And I continue with what happens next. Uh, it says, but the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. He's there with us, folks. It says, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Why is that put there? Remember the context of marriage. Peter is, Peter is saying, well, when you get all hot and bothered, remember the eyes of the Lord are upon you. And his ear is open for your prayer. One of the best things you can do if you have an issue or all in a marriage, stop right there and take it to prayer. Before you get into any conversation that may blow up, take it to God first. It has, it has a habit of easing everything. I used to tell people when I was in the Marine Corps and I would go out to a Bible study and come back, I would always have my Bible out. When I would walk in and I'm dealing with people that are farthest thing from God, I would walk in my, in my, in my uh, the equivalent of a dorm and these guys got, you know, penthouse and playboy. They, putting them away. It's almost like they were instantly condemned. And I wasn't, wasn't holier than thou. It's just they saw, we got the Bible, we got these penthouse magazines. Their conscience was already searing them. <coughs> it was already letting them know that. I was like, whoa, whoa, guys, you know, this, this is what you do. You do what you feel is right in front of your God. Okay, Corporal Muscle, okay, okay. Being very, very respectful. But my goal was to bring them to Christ, not make them feel condemned. Bible tells us. And the face of the Lord is against them that do evil 
And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? That's in the context of coming together as a family. Who can hurt us? What does the Bible say about that? If you feel like I'm scared or something's going to hurt me. Matthew 10 and 28, before we go to our last scripture, Matthew 10 and 28, Jesus made this clear. And fear not them which is, and I'm sorry, fear not them which kill the body. You know, as Christians, we have to look beyond the body because we're not living for the body. If we're living for the body, we are missing the mark 100%. We're living, for, we're living to get to that glorious body that's going to lead to incorruption. The Bible says, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's about as real as it gets. And our last verse, 1 Peter 3, 14 and 15. But now he's kicking to now. Well, I suffer so much dealing with this man. What does the Bible say? But and if you suffer for righteous sake, which means you got to be in the game playing. You can't complain to me in that, not even in the game. Suffer for righteous sake. Happy are ye. It says, and be not afraid of the terror, neither be troubled. What are you supposed to do? But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What can you tell your spouse if both of you are on your last nerve? You know, we represent the church. And we're having difficulties right now, but we're going to make this through. Because we're on Christ's side. No matter how bad it hurts, it's worth fighting for. But how can you say that? Because the scriptures tell us. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us, church. Lesson is yours. Good morning to the saints and all visitors as well. We're thankful to God that we're able to hear another powerful message from the word of God. And we thank Brother Richard Nelson IV, one of our elders, uh, for teaching us this morning. It is now 943. We will have a word of prayer. We'll give all of you an opportunity to, if you need to take a bathroom break or to stretch your legs, please, as you enter the auditorium, uh, remain socially distant. There's plenty of room in the middle, and uh, but everybody's doing well. You're sitting with your families, want to maintain the, the distancing, uh, but most importantly, want to maintain closeness to the Almighty God. At this time, let us together pray. Gracious God, our Father, we're thankful for yet another day, for life, for health, and for strength. So much is going on in our world, dear God, that we just look to you. Our faith is in you, dear God. And we're thankful for this, another opportunity to assemble, uh, to worship you through your son, Jesus Christ, in spirit and in truth. Be with all the brethren that will lead us in worship this day. Be with all the families that are present. Be with those who are in bereavement. Be with those that are sick. And Father, we just, we're just thankful to just praise your name this day in an orderly and decent manner, spiritual manner, based on the standard of truth. We thank you for the word that was taught in Bible class that we apply it to our very lives and be willing to apply it each and every day. Dear God, thank you. Dismiss us from this, our Bible class. As we prepare for worship, may, we have, may our hearts be focused on serving you in the manner which you prescribe through your word. In Jesus' name, amen.